Have you ever been driving on a two-lane blacktop highway and gotten stuck behind an 18-wheeler? And every time this happens to me, they are going slightly slower than I want to go right now. And, and it's one of those big 18-wheelers with the trailer so big I can't possibly see around it. Every time I get close enough to pass, I see nothing. I can't tell if anybody's coming. So I go to pass and somebody's coming and I duck back behind him. And I think, I don't need to pass. I'll just sit back here. And 20 minutes goes by and no cars come by. And 30 minutes go by and no cars come by. Fine, I'm going to pass. There's nobody coming. And I stick my nose out, there's a car and I've got to pull back behind him. What we have at that point is called a limited field of view. I cannot see what is coming down the road towards me. Any decision that I make is based on a lack of information. I don't know what's going to happen. See, what I need is someone with an unlimited field of view, perhaps a helicopter flying over the 18-wheeler, and he's on a cell phone to me, and he could call me and say, okay, it's clear, pass now. That'd be great, right? And this is a little annoying when we're stuck behind an 18-wheeler on a two-lane highway. But what can happen is we can start to function this way in our daily life. See, in daily life, I have an even more limited view. I can see what's in front of me right now. I don't know what's going on behind me. I don't know what's going on outside. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I really don't remember that well what happened yesterday. I have an extremely limited view. And I can start to make decisions about how I think things should be based on my limited view. I'll see God give mercy to somebody that I think shouldn't have it. That's a bad person. They should suffer. And God shows them mercy. But see, I, I have a limited view. I don't know what's going on. All I can see is what's in front of me. God, he's got an unlimited view. He's like he's up in that helicopter over the 18-wheeler, only he can not only see the road, he knows every car that's ever been down it, every car that's ever going to go down it, every car that might go down it. He knows where the road goes. He knows if there's construction. He knows if there's traffic. He has a completely unlimited view. And if I start to think I know who ought to receive mercy and who shouldn't, I am vastly underqualified to make that decision. Only someone with an unlimited view, God, would be capable of deciding who should receive mercy and who should not. I'm just a little man in a little car stuck behind a big 18-wheeler. And I got no idea what's coming down the road. And I have no place telling him who should receive mercy and who should not. Today we're going to look at a fella who is upset because God showed somebody mercy that he doesn't think he should have. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to the book of Jonah. I'll be in chapter 3. I'll be beginning at verse 10. Jonah is a mad man at this point. He is crazy upset. And he's upset because God chose to show mercy. Jonah goes to Nineveh. He obeys God. And he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And then he walks out of town. And the people believe. And they repent. And God relents. When God saw their deeds that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The first question that jumps into my mind when I read this is, wait a minute, did God just change his mind? Does God change his mind? God is without variation or shifting shadow. He is the unchanging, eternal God. The question is, does God change his mind? And for the answer, we have to look at Scripture. Exodus 32, 14 says, So then the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Sounds like he changed his mind. Jeremiah 26, 13, Now therefore the... Therefore, amend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God and the Lord will change his mind about the misfortune which he has pronounced against you. This is about to get real tricky. What we have going on here is a limitation in our language. 
See, we are creatures that live in time sequentially, A, B, C, straight through time, right? And God does not. God is not restricted in time. God exists outside of time. He was before time. He created time. He sees everything simultaneously. We don't have any way in our language to describe what's going on here. Before time even began, there's no time, God created the plan. Everything that's ever going to happen. This plan was decided before time started, before second one occurred, before he spoke creation into existence, he'd already figured out everything that's going to happen. It's not that he changes his mind when these things happen. When we're sitting here in Nineveh, God doesn't go, oh, well, they relented. I'm surprised by that. I'll do something different. He knew this would occur before time started, and he made alterations in the plan before he starts. But there's no way to really express that in English. That would get really confusing in Jonah to have to stop and explain pan-temporal omniscience to the people Jonah's writing to. So he writes it in a way that sounds like God changed his mind. But what we need to learn from this, the important thing to understand, is that God accounted for how we would respond. There's no change as the plan is going along. It's fixed and set. But before he even created the universe, he accounted for the fact that the people of Nineveh would repent. He accounted for the fact of every stupid thing I'm ever going to do. And I find that very comforting. Now, you guys know how I like to illustrate things with stories or examples. Or i got to tell you, there is absolutely no way I can illustrate this from life. There's no illustration or example I could give from everyday life that explains pan-temporal omniscience. It's not going to happen. We can't understand it, but we can trust it. We can live by it. The important thing to understand is that God adjusted the plan to account for our reaction, how we respond. The plan takes that into account. He is never surprised. And he relents. And he doesn't punish the people that Jonah thinks he should punish. You ever had that happen? Somebody that you were around that you just knew deserved it. Somebody that's, that's suffering, and you're not worried about it or upset at all. You're like, well, he earned that. He, he, he deserves that one. And then God will relent. And sometimes we don't like that. That one should suffer. God, let him suffer. Leave him there right now. And God relents, and we don't like it. That's what happens to Jonah. God relents and Jonah gets very upset, but it gradually, it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry and prayed to the Lord and said, please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. And I know that feeling. I've been there, where life gets so messed up and things are so horrible that you'd really just feel like, boy, life is bad. Death would be better to me than life. But this seems really dramatic to me for Jonah. There are folks that want to say the reason Jonah was this upset is because he was embarrassed. God made him look bad. Just think about this. He's a prophet. And he shows up and he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And then it's not. He looks bad. I'm supposed to be a prophet. What I say is supposed to happen. And then it doesn't. But I don't think that's what Jonah's that upset about. I think Jonah's upset because God didn't do things the way he thought it should go. Jonah's got a limited view. He's stuck behind that 18-wheeler looking at the back of the trailer, and he cannot see what's coming down the road. He knows Nineveh is full of wicked people. He knows they're going to 
enslave Israel and haul them off. He disagrees with God. He gets angry at God because God didn't do things the way he wanted him to do them. And I understand that feeling. I've been there. There's a point where we begin to question God. God, how could you let this wonderful person suffer? God, why did you allow this horrible person to prosper? And those questions are fine. The questions are good. I don't know if you've noticed, but throughout the Bible, people question God. Job questions God. David questions God. Look through the Psalms and see how often David questions God. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day and you do not answer and by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy. O oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. When we go look at David's questions in the Psalms, I want you to notice something. David will ask the questions, and every time there will be a point where he pivots, yet or but. And it becomes a praise of God. You are the Almighty. You are the Holy of Holies. You are the Righteous One. These questions are amazing. We want to question God. It's thoroughly acceptable and okay to question God. When you have a relationship with someone, you ask them questions. How was your day? What's going on? When we have a relationship with God, it is thoroughly acceptable to ask the questions. How could you? Why did you? Why don't you? But those questions need to lead us to who God is and who we are. They need to lead us to the almighty, holy, righteous one who is God. When I ask, how could you? The answer needs to be, because he is God. When I ask, why did you allow? The answer needs to be, because I am a limited being who does not know much. And God is the almighty, omniscient, omnipresent, all-powerful God who does. The questions are fine as long as they lead us to who he is and who we are. The problem becomes when the questions lead us the wrong way. Sometimes the questions lead us to thinking we are more than we are. God, how could you? I know better. God, why did you allow this? I would have done it different. And that's when we end up angry like Jonah. And I know it happens. It happens to me. I, I see things happen and I, I don't like them. And I disagree with God about it. And when I forget who I am and how limited my view is and who he is and how unlimited his view is, then I get self-righteous. And I start thinking I know better than he does. What we've got to do is understand our place and our position and our limited view. God is going to teach Jonah about his limited view. He's going to use a very interesting life lesson. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be shade over his head, to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered it. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down upon Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul, saying, Death is better to me than life. And God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And Jonah replied, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Jonah is a little dramatic here. Dealt with some teenagers that had similar responses. Everything was to death. God is explaining and illustrating to Jonah his limited nature. Notice how much God appoints in this. God appoints a worm. God appoints a plant. God appoints a wind. God appoints the sun. God is saying to Jonah, look how in control I am, man. I just made a plant for shade for you and a worm to eat it and a sun to blow it down. I am in control. You are not. 
Okay, so we're back on the two-lane blacktop highway this time. Only this time there's no 18-wheeler in front of us. We're driving along. It's good, clear weather. We can see for miles. We've driven down this road hundreds of times. We know where we're going. The car's in fantastic shape. I got a GPS that tells me where I need to be. I got a phone app over here that tells me if there's any construction or any traffic. I'm doing phenomenal. The only problem is there's a two-year-old in the back seat. And the two-year-old's view is about the back of my headrest. That's all they can see. They've never driven a car. They don't even know the road. They don't have a GPS or a cell phone app. And yet the kid in the back seat is yelling, stop, go, turn, are we there yet? I want you to picture that's what it's like for God. He's driving, we're the two-year-old in the back seat. He knows exactly where he's going. He's trying to get us down a road that gets us to be more like Christ. He's got a GPS. He knows right where it is. He knows where you are. He knows how to get there. The car's in perfect shape. And we sit in the back seat going, why? No, don't stop. Are we there yet? We need to let him drive. We need to shut up and let him drive. Pay more attention to what he's got to say about where we're going and how to get there and a lot less about what we think ought to be right or fair or just. We don't want justice. Do you understand that? Justice means we all go to hell. You got that? We don't want justice. We want grace and mercy. And look, it's thoroughly okay to ask about things. God, how come this wonderful lady is suffering? God, why do these wicked people prosper? But when we ask those questions, it needs to lead us to his greatness and our limitedness. It is awesome to pray for mercy for those that are suffering. I think that is phenomenal, a great thing to do. I seriously do not recommend praying for the wicked to suffer. You might feel confident in doing that. I'm just not confident in saying that. I think it's awesome to pray for those suffering to get mercy. I think it's a bad idea to pray for those that are wicked to suffer. So now God is going to explain the life lesson to Jonah. He says, Then the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left hand, as well as many animals? Jonah had compassion on the plant. And God says, look, you're all upset to the point of death about losing this plant. You didn't make it. You didn't grow it. You didn't create it. It was here briefly and it's gone. Get over it. This is going to sound a little harsh, but this truly applies to each and every one of us when we get upset about losing stuff. If I had a car and I lost it, if I had a favorite guitar and it gets busted, if I, any stuff I've got and God takes it away, it was not mine in the first place. It's all his. We don't make anything. We don't earn anything. We want to feel like we do, but it's all his to take as he pleases. Growing up, I had a, a friend that had the best toys in the neighborhood. Nobody had as good of toys as Mike Smith. This guy, if it came on commercial on TV within the day, his mom had gotten it for him. He had everything ever made for G.I. Joe. This was the guy you wanted to go play with his toys. Every day, Mom, can I go play over at Mike's? Okay, and I'd go over to Mike's. There was only one problem. Mike got to make the rules. So we went over there, and he decided we were playing Space G.I. Joes that day. We were playing Space G.I. Joes. And you better not start talking like your G.I. Joe is in the jungle, because he will kick you out. We're playing Space G.I. Joes today. What we've got to understand is that this planet, this whole universe is God's toys and he will do with them as he pleases and we need to be thankful and grateful for what he allows us but we're playing by his rules and if we don't play by his rules he will take the toys 
Jonah says, I mean, God says to Jonah, there's 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left hand. That's a Hebrew idiom that means small children that don't know good from bad, right from wrong. He's saying to Jonah, there's 120,000 kids in this town and animals, and you want me to just destroy all of them? But you had compassion on that plant. Jonah, your view is so limited. You don't know. You're behind the 18-wheeler. You can't see what's coming, and you got no idea, and you're telling me who to have compassion on and who not to have compassion on. One of the things that is amazing to me about the whole book of Jonah is that this question is asked, and it's not answered. God asks Jonah the question. Let's remember, Jonah's the one writing it. God asked Jonah the question, and then Jonah, who could have written an answer, doesn't. He leaves the answer up to us. This book was written to the people of Israel about 720-something B.C., and the address to them is, you guys aren't having compassion on anybody else. Israel had become very isolated. They felt they were so far vastly better than everybody else that everybody else should suffer. We're the children of God. Nobody else should get anything. They had no compassion on anybody. They were not presenting God's message to the world like they were supposed to. And God said, look, I'm going to have compassion on who I have compassion on. And he leaves it hanging. And the people of Israel needed to figure out they were supposed to show compassion. We as a country, as a people, need to take this message to heart. We got a country and a world full of people that are very lost, very wicked, no question about it, no debate about it. But they are all God's people. We need to bring them the message. Okay, so now we're back on that two-lane blacktop. And this time, we're in a self-driving car. Have y'all seen those yet? They have self-driving cars. Google makes one. Tesla makes one. You get in, you tell the horn you want to go, and it just goes, right? I'm not too wild about this idea just yet. I've worked with computers my whole life, and they crash, and they get viruses, and they mess up. But this is a different kind of self-driving car. This self-driving car is a God-driven car. You get in, it knows where it's going. It knows how to get there. It knows how to get around traffic. It knows where it's supposed to go. Be more like Jesus. All you got to do is sit in the back and go along for the ride. Here's the amazing thing. We all already have that. We all already possess the self-driving, God-driven car. His name is the Holy Spirit. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the capacity to let him drive, to not grieve him to listen to him, to follow his advice, to follow his direction. You're not really stuck behind the 18-wheeler. If you just let go of the wheel, let him drive. Quit trying to tell him where to go. Quit asking, are we there yet? Just go for the ride and enjoy life and have God's peace. But to allow this self-driving car to drive, you have to trust. To trust him to drive, before you can trust him to drive, you've got to trust him as your Savior. If there's anyone here who has not placed their trust and faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, in a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer and we're going to sing a song and I would invite you to come forward and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Father God, you are awesome, amazing, mighty, wonderful, beautiful, powerful, and we trust you. Father God, you have an unlimited field of view. You know everything that has occurred, will occur, could occur. Father, help us to keep that perspective in life, to ask the questions, but let that lead us to your greatness. Father, help us to keep our pride and ego in check so that we do not think that we know better than you do. Help us to understand that all material things are yours, and we thank you for the use of them, but we will not get angry over the loss of them. Guide us in this world. You know where you want us to go and how you want us to get there. Help us to let go of the wheel and allow you to bring us safely to the destination. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen.